I saw some, when I was making my comments yesterday and providing opinions with the panel, I saw some perplexed looks in the room, um, and I don't blame you. Um, I saw a lot of faces that kind of said, she's a USDA vet, but why is that her opinion? So I wanted, kind of like Mary had the opportunity to do yesterday, I wanted to sort of explain myself a little bit, um, because I think some of both my professional and my personal background play into all of those opinions and recommendations and thoughts, and, and so I wanted to provide a little bit of that. Um, professionally, I came from equine private practice, and I still maintain my licenses in both Texas and here in Colorado. Um, so that, that's what I went to school to do. That's what I wanted to do originally. That's where I came from. Um, so the veterinary practitioner perspective specific to equine is really important to me. Um, additionally, when I moved out of veterinary practice and went into regulatory medicine, my first job was the epidemiologist for the Texas Animal Health Commission. That is the state animal health authority for Texas. So I have a state veterinarian's perspective that I come with too. And sometimes my federal counterparts see that come out at inopportune times when the state perspective comes rolling out and they go, wait a minute, you're a Fed, you gotta stop thinking like that. Um, and then for the last 12 years I've, I've been a federal veterinarian and, and you guys know my background with relationship to uh, infectious disease epidemiology and specifically outbreak response. And for 13 years, state and federal, that's been what I do every day. Um, so I try to bring all of those perspectives into some of the things that I bring to the table relative to equine. But on the personal side, um, I'm a lifelong owner and rider. I spend one to four hours every day with my own horses. Whether I'm feeding, cleaning, or riding, I'm spending that time every day with them. And so I do have an ownership perspective. I am still a member of several of the organizations represented in this room. So I bring some of that perspective also to the table. And sometimes it's, it looks a little um, schizophrenic <laughs> when you hear my answers to some questions. Um, but hopefully you'll see that I'm trying with my recommendations and with my opinions and with the way we discuss things, I try to bring to the table all of those equine perspectives from all of those different camps. And sometimes it works really well and sometimes it just leaves perplexed looks I got yesterday. So I get it. Let's see here. Um, this is me riding my new mare that I bought two years ago. So I'm going to talk to you about what happens when you try to trace these chips, because some of the stories are really funny. And I have dozens and dozens of these stories. I just picked a few case examples to highlight the numerous things that go wrong when you try to do this. And, and I hope that we keep these in mind as you begin moving forward so that maybe we can start to close some of these gaps as we build things. So specifically, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Who's trying to trace these things and for what purpose? Well, me, right? <laughs> but also, you met a lot of state and federal animal health officials that are here in the room, and they're also trying to trace these on the ground in a local disease response or local investigation. So I'm not the only one. Um, and certainly, you heard Diane's perspective. She's traced some of these chips through her own EIA database. But also, we get calls and we get involved with owners of lost and stolen horses, be it lost and stolen as part of a disease investigation, you heard Katie talk about the horses that disappear. You heard Carl talk about horses that disappear that were under quarantine. Um, but also we've recovered quite a few horses that have disappeared where it really wasn't the owner attempting to break the quarantine. It was um, a, a product of where they were keeping the horse where it actually was stolen. Um, also the disease trace back, we've talked about all of these. Um, I'm going to talk about some other things you may not have thought of. Um, we have uh, border personnel that pick up stray and smuggled horses, and sometimes we have to figure out exactly what happened there. Was that ours? Was that Mexico's? What happened? Where did this come from? Did it start with us, go to them, got diseased? What is this? Is it a part of a larger smuggling ring? And I'm going to talk about one of those that we did uncover. Um, and then certainly we try to assist with the recovery of lost and stolen horses when it's part of our investigations or when we get contacted. So here was that question of success we talked about yesterday, and I'd like to put a little plug in for this to be in your mind. There are probably other parameters to what is a successful traceback, but these are two that I use on a pretty regular basis. Did I make contact with some sort of entity that has information about the specific horse attached to that chip? That is a measure of success for me. Did I find a human being who had information about this horse related to that chip? 
And how long did it take me to get that information? How long did it take me to get to that entity that had something to give me? And I don't really care at this point what it was. If it was the thing's life history or was just, hey, it's in our database from, you know, January 1st, 2010. Let's just leave that as it is. But I would pitch to you that when you talk about successful traceback, you might think of these parameters and potentially others that you come up with. So we're going to go through a few case studies here. And I apologize, this, I had to um, print this out of an IES case investigation. So the actual photograph is with the black helicopters, right? <laughs> Locked away from me, that's for sure. Um, we had a load of 10 horses that was intercepted, being smuggled into Texas from Mexico. This, um, this happens more often than you would like to think. And they're intercepted by a lot of different um, means. In this, in this particular case, um, it was a neighbor who owns huge swaths of land, obviously in South Texas, who saw a horse trailer loaded with horses coming out of his neighbor's gate, and he knew the neighbor doesn't live there, and he knew there's no horses on that 5,000-acre property, and that there should not be horses coming out of a trailer there. And he called it in. Um, they call it in either to our uh, cattle fever tick personnel that ride the border, um, the old adage, uh, telephone, telegraph, tell a tick rider. That's how information flows on the border sometimes. But also um, Customs and Border Protection personnel, um, numerous other entities, state forces that are down there, get this information and they share it. When we grabbed all these horses, when we find either stray or smuggled horses on the border, we bring them into a holding facility, place them under quarantine, obviously, and we test them for all of the diseases that they would have been tested for to enter legally at a Mexican crossing station. Because the point is, if we can't identify the ownership, either on the Mexican side or on the U.S. side, then it becomes state federal property. And if it passes all the disease tests and it meets all the requirements for official entry, we can sell those through a livestock market and actually make back the money that it costs to feed those horses. So that's a normal process. When we tested these horses, um, all were test positive for equine paraplasmosis. You can see from these pictures they were also in really poor condition. Um, nobody could tell what breed these were. Most of their, the adult horses, their tails were chewed off. There were four foals with them. Um, they looked like they had had a pretty rough, rough go. And any paperwork I had attached to these, everyone guessed a different breed on what they were. You just really couldn't tell. These were gray stuff. Incidentally, I'm really glad someone bothered to do this, they scan them for microchips. Even looking at this POS that you see here, why would you do that? They scanned for microchips, and all the adults were chipped. So we had a series of chip numbers. They were 982s, 985s, you know, kind of your basic chip numbers that you get when you just sort of randomly scan stuff and have no idea what it is. Um, and I've given you an example of one of the specific numbers there that I traced. But the way that I do this now is I go online, and there's this one little website that has a list of all the manufacturer three-digit prefix codes, and I start calling the manufacturer that has that code. That's what I have right now, because you see I'm left with a horse that I have no connection to what it is or where it might have come from, and I have a chip number. So I have to start with the known information. Um, I mentioned yesterday that all the calls to the manufacturers I have made in the past have been very successful. I found them, all of the manufacturers to be wonderful to work with, and they've always been able to give me the next piece of information, who they sold it to, and some sort of contact number for that next entity, whether it's a distributor or a breed registry or whatever it is they have. So for this particular one, the call to manufacturer gave me a distributor located in Europe, which was kind of weird. I hadn't really had to call Europe before. Calls and emails back and forth to the distributor, um, they actually sold that chip to a breed registry in Spain, the Spanish PRE res registry. And I had never heard of the Spanish PRE registry. These are Andalusians, but this is their Spanish registry. And so I Googled them to figure out, well, who are these guys, right? While I'm waiting for their time zone to change so I can call somebody over there, I look them up. And praise the Lord, hallelujah, these people have their stuff together. They have on their website an online microchip lookup. Wow, I was floored because I know none of us had that. But I was putting in microchip numbers, and it does pull up the horse. It, I was actually able to find these specific animals. They were born in Spain. They were registered in Spain. Some of these um, 
some of these cases that were in that I could get online actually had pictures of them showing in Spain just two years prior. So I had physical information of where these horses were a very short time prior to when we picked them up. So for this case study, and that was the animal that you saw in that picture when she was showing in Spain. Who would have ever known in the condition that she arrived uh, in America illegally? I consider this one obviously a really successful trace back. First of all, we did ultimately identify a very large smuggling ring. It's been going on probably 15, 20 years. Um, it focused on illegal importation, specifically of Spanish PREs from Spain. We know they go on boats. They cross the water. They do not go on planes, which is why they look so terrible when they get off the boat. They're moved across overland through Mexico, and then they're smuggled across the Texas-Mexican border, and they're bound in most cases for California, the ones that we found anyway. And I think the good news was that testing of additional horses in California that related to some of the people involved with these animals ended up finding some more peripositive horses that were here in the U.S. The, this whole, the whole idea of this ring is they bring them over here very cheaply, they clean them up, and they sell them for $20,000, $25,000. Um, they've not been CEM tested. That's a CEM affected region. They have not been PERO tested, EIA tested, Doring, Glanders, you name it. Big problems. And this is a very long standing smuggling ring. So, despite some of the good and bad outcomes from this, um, it did at least give me some knowledge that there may be entities out there, probably not yet in the US, but in other countries, that may have the ability to do some microchip tracing and microchip lookup easily. And maybe those are the types of examples we ought to look at in the future. The time to success on this was four days. I thought that was pretty darn good. I mean, these horses weren't going anywhere. Um, and we did actually destroy them because we really are not in the business of treating stuff that we don't know what to do with. Um, for U.S.-owned horses, obviously, they have the opportunity to be treated and cleared and go on to their life for pyroplasmosis. But in this case, um, the state and federal governments are not funding that um, for stuff that is illegally transported. So here's a different one. Um, stray horse intercepted the Mexican border. Test negative for disease of interest, but so that was really good. This was one that could be eligible for, for sale in the US. Um, but it did have a microchip, and so we really have to attempt to trace this back and see, is there a named owner, either in Mexico or in the US, that this horse needs to go back to and have that person pay their feed bill and get them back home? So I did the same thing, chip prefix, identify the manufacturer, call the manufacturer who sold it to a distributor. When I got to the first distributor, I had several problems. The first guy I talked to said, oh, it took me a couple people. And the second or third guy I talked to said, um, is this a two millimeter chip or a four millimeter chip? I said, dude, this isn't a live horse that I have not cut it out of its neck to measure the size of the chip. I don't know. And he says, wait, it's in a horse? Well, this is a wildlife chip. It's supposed to be in a fish. Well, it's not. Thanks for that super interesting tidbit. But it's not in a fish. It's in a horse. So what can you tell me about the information related to the chip that I found in this horse? He hemmed and hawed, and he said, look, this is a really old chip. We've gone through changes of software three, four, five times. I'm sure many distributors will tell you this. Um, we've upgraded, and we do have this data. It's in this old IBM computer in the corner with DOS software, and nobody knows how to operate it except our founder, and he comes in on Wednesdays for an hour. I'll ask him to fire that thing up and look this up for you. Please do. Um, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> right? Um, essentially, this ended up being a dead end. I mean, you can imagine there's really not, not going to be anything of value there, but the time for me to get to the dead end status took a couple weeks. That's not really good traceability. That's, that's not, I mean, if I can very quickly determine it's a dead end, I even think that's better than having to wait around for two weeks and not know. So another strange and interesting sort of thing, and be aware, people put weird chips that aren't supposed to be in horses in horses, okay? Who knows? Uh, here's another case study. This one was uh, just from this year. We had a cluster of 17 pyropositive bushtrack quarter horse racehorses in Tennessee. 
Um, this was, was kind of unfortunate. These are these are nice horses. They they had a previous sanctioned race career. Most of them, they had a life. They had lost their identity. So we had plenty of lip tattoos. Some of them were easy to read. Some of them were hard to read. Some of them were permanently uh, altered on purpose. Not cool. Um, but several of the horses, in addition to their lip tattoos, also had microchips, which was I thought that was interesting. I was wondering who would have done that and why when they had their lip tattoo. But essentially all of them, um, these are racing quarter horses, all of them had lost their registered names, their registered papers somewhere along the way. So to me, the fastest method of trace back is, as Katie said, when we get lip tattoos, we go straight to the breed registries, and, and both Jockey Club and AQHA have always worked with us um, to help us get to the bottom of what we're looking at. The problem was with some of the altered tattoos, right? We really can't sort that out. When someone attempts and does a good job of trying to erase that horse's life, whether it was a stolen horse or whatever it was, they do a good job. They're, they're intent on it, and we really can't figure that out. For those whose lip tattoos could be confirmed, the time to identification by the lip tattoo, one to three hours. It was just like two phone calls and an email, and we were, we were there, if even. Um, so that was the best way and the quickest way for us to get a registered name go into Equibase, get the sanctioned race history, get owners and trainers that were previously associated. Now, there's a gap of time, right, from its sanctioned racing career to where it fell it off the face of the earth and went into this bush track industry. That's okay. We're epidemiologists on the state and federal side, and our job is to go talk to the people and ask the questions, figure it out, well, who did you sell it to and how did it get where it was? We don't necessarily need every piece of data of its life in your database. Let us do our job. Let us go ask the questions. We are epidemiologists. That is essentially what we're supposed to do. We are the cool animal disease detectives. I think it's a cool job. Um, but that's what we do. It doesn't mean that every piece of data for that horse's life needs to be with its registered microchip. We just need clues. We need little pieces so that we can then go talk to people and use investigative techniques to figure out and fill in the holes. So I was interested, I found a bunch of the lip tattoos and we had some information, but the microchip numbers, does this stuff match up with what we found with the tattoos? I thought I'd give it a try. So again, I have nothing to go on other than the prefixes, so I called the manufacturer. Manufacturer sold to a veterinary supply company, but the manufacturer immediately told me, look, this vet supply company I know is out of business. They're sold, they're gone, they don't exist anymore, but I can tell you who they sold to another vet supply company. Here's their contact info. Like I said, manufacturers, you guys are fantastic. You, you really do preemptively figure out where we're gonna fall down and you try to help if you have it. So I talked to four different people at this new, the vet supply company that bought the old one. Um, certainly they confirmed we have no records from the previous vet su supply company. So I'm thinking, okay, well we're at a dead end here, I get that. Kind of like Katie's story with um, our CEM veterinarian, records are gone. But out of curiosity, I asked them, I said, well, you guys are also a veterinary supply company. When you sell chips today, do you keep that information and is it available? And this extremely large veterinary supply company told me, oh, we don't record any of that. Okay, look, they're a keg, they're a piece of our industry that is supposed to have some responsibility in their role for selling those microchips. And they're refusing to do that most basic thing of record keeping related to, I sold this series of chips to Clinic A or whatever it was they did. They simply don't do it. And I'm still trying to contact folks at this supply company to ask the questions, why isn't that done? And this really shouldn't be happening. Is there something we can do better differently? Just know that some of those problems are out there. It's not at the manufacturer level. It may not even be at a couple of key distributor levels. Some of these distributors are fantastic, have records back to the 90s, I mean, wonderful. And some of them don't even bother to record it. So dead end on that one, time dead end, three days. Um, and it's a dead end for any chip that goes through this very large veterinary supply company, which I find to be um, Pretty frustrating. So here's another horse in that, in that same cluster. 
we'll try this one, see if we can find it. So uh, call the manufacturer on this one. The manufacturer uh, sold it to a private distributor. Call the distributor, left a message. It's a small company. But the next day, the distributor called me back, says, hey, I have all the records. I've been doing this a long time. Um, I sold this chip to this specific practice. Here's the name of the practice, the name of the veterinarian, and the phone number for the practice. I said, great, man, this may go somewhere, right? Because now we're going to get to a veterinarian who's supposed to keep records. We all know that can be either way. That can go either way. Um, it was not in Utah, so I have some semblance that these might be real records. <laughs> Sorry, Barry. Um, and Diane's in the room, so Diane and I worked on this together. This, this was a chip and a practice that was in Louisiana. So I knew right away, because we were dealing with, with Louisiana, that this was probably tied to their EIA program, right? But I wanted to go through the vet first. Let's see if he can find it. When I called the practice, um, no record of the chip number for the practice because they keep all paper records. And the, um, the owner of the practice was going to give me a call. I was just talking to the practice manager, and she said, oh, look, you know, we're a mixed animal. We do a little bit of equine. All of our records are paper. I don't really have a way to search that. Do you have the horse's name? Mm -mm. Do you have the owner's name? <laughs> no way I'm calling you for that. Um, so I have the chip number, and they don't have a way to look it up. But in the interim, I call Diane and, and say, oh, okay, the state's going to have this, right? So Diane goes into her super excellent database with her lookup, right? And she says, it's not here. I don't got it. She said, who's the practitioner? So we talked about that clinic and that practice, and she said, look, I'll be honest with you. That particular practitioner is not really good about sending in his paperwork. So here was the whole end-to-end -end system, right, that Louisiana built that works well in most cases, that uses accredited veterinarians, that has a long-standing history, that's meant to do something good, and the one little piece at the very end where it was just send in the paperwork never got done, and that's a dead-end trace. The vet did try really hard. He called me back a couple different times. He was digging through paper records. Um, he asked me, well, when did I see this horse? Dude, I don't know. I mean, I can give you a date range of about four years, starting from when the thing was alive to when I found it here positive, right? Th these are really hard. And, and so the idea of just sticking microchips in horses and not having a way to get to the entity that has information and that entity having a way to search that information is problematic. So we really have to think about all of those different steps um, when you look harder at this issue. So I actually did know the registered name of this horse. I wasn't going to give it to him, but I thought, hey, let's test this out. If I, if I knew something more about the horse, could he find it? No way. I mean, I had the registered name. I gave him some other things. Couldn't find this horse. So time to dead end was one week on this one, but it was a true death-defying dead end. You're just not going to get there, even though it looked really good from the onset. So I have a few conclusions just from these few cases. And again, I have dozens of other examples. But we have so many parties in the chain responsible for keeping records in the life of an equine microchip, just right now, today, people who are sticking in chips right now. And failure to either keep or transfer those records at any single step is an ultimate dead end. It's just one person in the chain. If everybody else is doing things right, that sounds like it should work but it just is one piece that comes crashing down. Certainly my best outcomes so far for tracing have been achieved when the end information is maintained either by a breed registry or an industry group, a discipline, or other equine industry group. Because you guys are keeping the information, you're policing the information, you're making sure the, the stuff gets registered and gets back to you because you're using it for other purposes. And I think that's really where the piggyback should be. These systems should work for all of the industry, for your needs as a breed registry, for your needs as a discipline organization, for veterinary needs as a practitioner, for regulatory needs if there's a problem. Um, so it really shouldn't be built for any one of these entities, but any entity who's able to get out in front and do it first and do it best is going to be a gold standard. And again, I, I still think so far, 
um, the breed registries and the discipline groups and the equine industry groups are the ones that have been most successful. Having to trace stepwise, starting with the manufacturer and the stupid three-digit code, is not helpful. Some, sometimes these chips go straight from point A to B. Most of the times they go through six other entities. It takes me weeks to find anybody who might have had it, and then they don't have the information. So even though manufacturers have done a great job, we've got to have a better way. And that's some of my comments yesterday regarding if we had an equine microchip lookup tool, I can tell you who the manufacturer is already. I don't need that part. But if it could get us closer to the end entity that has the most information about that chip, that would really save a lot of time and that would really help all of us look up what we need to look up. And then I call that entity and they decide. They're the protectors of their data and they decide whether or not they can share some things with me and I'm only going to be asking for specific pieces of information related to the disease. If it's CEM, we're talking about breeding records. If it's Puro, I'm looking for owners and trainers because I've got horses that they used to have that I need to go test. It's completely different. I may not be looking. I definitely don't want all your info. I probably don't want your DNA info unless we have a fraudulent blood issue. Um, so all of those things depend on the disease and what it is we're tracing. But the key is there's very limited pieces of information from the regulatory side that we're going to want or need from you. And you still have the opportunity to tell us, no, my data, my constituents, my protection. And that's their safeguard because you are supposed to be the keepers. You are the group they trust. And that's really important, I think. And again, the need for that online lookup tool. Um, I think that deserves talking about it at some point, especially later this afternoon, probably. Um, there's my contact information. There's a couple of more um, comments I want to make real quick. There's another um, incident that came up just in the last two weeks that's been particularly frustrating, and it involves the lack of a microchip, where I think a chip would have really helped, and it's a situation that hasn't been brought up previously. We had a uh, six-year-old thoroughbred brown bay mare with very few markings that was polomare, presented with a group from Mexico to the United States at the Mexican border for entry into the U.S. And she unfortunately tested pretty high positive for glanders. So people kind of freaked out, understandably so. She had no clinical signs, and I do not believe this mare actually had glanders. She didn't meet any case definitions, but she clearly was a reactor mare, and she was having some sort of very significant cross-reaction to our glanders diagnostic test, which means we have to do something with that. The issue was that on the Mexican side, um, her owners and handlers insisted that she was a U.S. origin mare returning to the U.S., and they even gave me the health certificate number that they believe she left California on in August of 2016. Well, that's great information because searchability of export certs is not so good, okay? We're talking about paper again. We're talking about a couple of key things logged into a spreadsheet, not super searchable, definitely not searchable to individual animal level right now. But they gave me the cert number, and I went and asked for the cert to be pulled, and we looked at it. There were 22 horses on that cert, all polo horses, the correct types. Of those 22 horses, none of them matched the markings of this mare. She was not in that shipment. And we're currently arguing with the Mexican government that that mare was not in that load. I don't think they're lying to me. I really think they move a lot of polo horses back and forth. And she just wasn't in that particular load. What I don't have is what load she was in, if any. Um, I think the only piece of information that I can nail down, she did have a thoroughbred lip tattoo. Um, I do have a registered name for her. And I was able to do that lookup with Jockey Club. And so we have some information. She was born in the U.S., and I know her breeder. She was born in the U.S. in 2010. But beyond that, I have nothing. She had no sanctioned race history. It seems pretty clear that sometime right after her lip tattoo, she didn't race. She went into polo, and that's where she's been. But between 2010 and now, I can't tell you where she's been in the U.S. or how long she's been in Mexico and where this glanders titer might have come from. 
Obviously, it's not hugely important because, again, this mayor really doesn't have glanders. But think of the consequences. Think of the exercise if she was a clinical glanders mayor. And we have two countries pointing fingers at each other, saying, this is yours, no, this is yours. Who has glanders? Who should be doing the extensive trace back? Who should be freaking out and testing whole bunches of horses for glanders? Is it us or is it Mexico? That situation is one that is actually more volatile to the equine industry than you think as a whole. If we have issues with solving export import tracebacks with other countries, it may negatively impact your ability to import and export U.S. horses from that country or to that country. This tit for tat stuff, I know you guys who import export know how this goes down. You know, some of the, the requirements back and forth, it's not a USDA requirement for slaughter horses to Mexico to be microchipped. That's what Mexico demands because they have to track it for the EU. So we're not creating things, they're requiring things on us and that costs the industry money. Or they may not accept our horses at all. If we can't do a glanders trace back and show them that we've proven we don't have an issue, why should they take any of our horses? So the fact that if we had had a microchip in this horse, and if that microchip had been recorded as part of the export health certificate process, and pie in the sky, we're working very hard internally on this, if we did a better job within USDA import and export services on having some searchability to the import and export data, and it's much better with imports, they're working on it hard, I see the future for exports to do this. If we had an ability to search that, it wouldn't matter that they didn't have the right export health certificate to give me. I would be able to find her and confirm where she had been and gone back to her original polo farm so that Katie and her crew could do an investigation and we could make sure there wasn't a problem and we can assure the other country that no, the U.S. doesn't have glanders and no, we didn't send them glanders. In the absence of that, two things happen. One, we're really dangling a carrot over other countries to just kind of trust us but take our stuff anyway. And two, it's embarrassing, y'all. I mean, we're supposed to be not a third world country with IT systems and data and stuff, right? Look at everything your phone can do. It's, it's not a good way to progress. And I think for us and for the industry, regulatory and industry both, we've really got to find a way to address some of these shortfalls because I'm afraid that it's going to lead to more dollars being lost by the industry in the long run. Um, the other thing that I would make a comment on is um, beware in your discussions this afternoon of the topic of data quality. Um, I didn't ask Carl yesterday, but when Carl um, noticed that uh, they had the country code wrong, right, on that, um, what was it, a heifer or a steer? Was it on the heifer that came from Canada um, and was the rabies exposed. You were very quickly able to identify, you knew it was coming from Canada and with the country code, you knew that country code they were giving you was wrong. But what about the other 12 numbers in that, the other 12 digits in that number? How would you know if one of those is wrong? Well, I get, what I got, Angela, is I got the two numbers of the two heifers that came from Canada, one went to South or North Dakota, I can't remember. And it actually had the 124, and the one that came to Colorado had 224. So, you know, it didn't take a real, even I could figure it out. Uh, you know, and uh, so, you know, but it... But there's 12 other digits, right? I mean, even if we can, if, even if we can assess, hey, you know, that's the wrong country code. We know what country code Canada is. The other 12 numbers are a problem because really look at human nature. I, one of my absolute best equine animal health technicians is significantly dyslexic. I will not have him read a microchip number or record it in any way unless it's from the device electronically sent to something else because you really, veterinarians are tired. They haven't slept in days. 
People are tired. They're exhausted. They have fatigue at their computers. I mean, all of these things happen. So please do think about the issue of data quality, and let's make sure that we use these very simple techniques. And some of you yesterday mentioned several of them with the barcoding and with, with things on our phone or apps or things that exist that can prevent us from making the initial mistake. I'm worried, Diane, about some of your data entry that you're doing for your searchable fields, right? Because, I mean, your people know how to do it and they're doing the best they can, but a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of a bad day, we all make those kind of mistakes, and that'll render something completely unsearchable. So just think about that um, in your discussions this afternoon. And finally, I just want to pitch again, you guys don't have to have every point of data in that horse's life for these tracebacks to be successful. We just need a nugget. What do they say on Ancestry? Give me a leaf, right? That kind of thing. Um, let the state and federal epidemiologists do their job, which is we take that little tidbit of information, we go start talking to people, and we get more information, and we build the case, and we figure it out. You don't have to have everything, so please don't go there in your brain. Any of these little tidbits of information that you need to do what industry requires is actually going to end up helping us if those things can be recorded and pop properly traced back. So I'll leave it there, Katie, and that's essentially what I have for folks. But certainly if you have um, comments or questions um, for me, you're welcome to contact me anytime. Or certainly if you look at last year's um, meeting white paper, where we talked a lot about the diseases and some of that trace back and how difficult those were. If you have questions about that, um, please contact me and I'm happy to give you more information about how we do those. Um, are there any, we have plenty of time for questions, so anybody have any questions specific to what Angela has presented on tracing? Yeah, Lucas. So Angela, fantastic work on presenting this stuff. And uh, I just have a little comment. You know, I, I like to give PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that. So y you read it all about this, this rubbish or how to present PowerPoints. And you know, they say that story trumps words. Nothing to do with Donald. But you know, I think you portrayed some stories that are very powerful. So have you? Given these type of presentations to the industry and associations and the grassroots like owners, you know, people that we need to show what the value of these is. Because I think you being part of the government and showing that you don't need all the data, you just need this stuff. I mean, coming from you and people, you know, down in the trenches hearing these stories, I think it would be uh, very powerful. So. I know you're busy. Uh, yeah. I don't want to put more on your shoulders, but I think I'm deployed be... for screw worm outbreak right now. Actually, you can tell I'm actually in Florida right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think you know this, this type of these type of things, you know, being uh, communicated to, to yeah. people that are going to make the decisions are going to be very powerful. You guys are the guinea pigs for this. The only other time I presented this information was in October of last year at the U.S. Animal Health Association meeting. And that's mainly a meeting where it's mostly state and federal, but we do have some large industry groups that, that do um, come to that and, and help us um, work together to figure things out in regulatory veterinary medicine. Um, so I did present it to them and, and got some comments there. Um, I'm going to continue to write this stuff down. Um, my husband beats in my head that I really, really, really need to keep publishing stuff. <laughs> like I have time, like Katie has time. We keep trying. Um, both on state federal side, we work really hard. When we have these disease outbreaks, when we have these types of case studies, we need to do a better job of putting that information out and publishing it, whether it's in peer-reviewed journals or whether it's in lay journals. And so I, I do respond to a lot of um, lay journal media requests, the horse and, and many others. Um, to to give them some of this information um, when they're doing a story on it. And, and so I'm hoping if we continue to do a better job of that, that we can get some of these stories out there because there's a lot of misconceptions. I mean, just the misconception alone that we will not get into related to um, CEM testing on imports and where the giant gaping holes in that are that many of us in this room have dealt with. Um, you know, that's something that I don't think the industry really knows. I mean, Cliff knows, right, because I talk to Cliff about it constantly, and he's like, really? Wow, that's bad. Yes, it's bad. 
Um, so those types of informational pieces, I would really look forward to continuing to find venues to interact with industry and, and give them this information and these stories. So I really appreciate the comment, Lucas. Thank you. And I'm just going to add one on to that is a lot of times we get asked to present. They only want to know what we did and what, how many horses we killed. That's usually the first question they ask me. Well, how many did you kill? Well, we didn't kill any. Oh, okay. I mean, they don't really want to know how we do our jobs, and I think that's a hard thing. Um, we're not good at selling what we do. I, I will be the first one to say it. So for us to get that information out, um, as Angela said, these, there's a ton of these stories. This is not just three of them. I mean, there's, each of us could probably name three off the top of our heads. So we just don't know how to sell it. That's the bottom line. Um, so we need your help, and if there is a way we can give it to you and you can use it, or if there's a way for industry to partner with us to get that information out. Um, because I think it goes back to we're government and, and the message we're selling. It sounds like we're making a mountain out of our molehill. That's kind of what some people have said to me. Is it really that hard to trace a horse? Yeah, it really is. And when you actually sit there and actually show them the paperwork that we see, I mean, horses living in P.O. boxes and, you know, Coggins forms that aren't filled out and the description is just bay. That's what we go through on a daily basis. And articulating that point to the industry, I don't know if they'd care because they would just say that it's our job, which it is. So I'd be interested in others' thoughts on that. Cliff, um, Cliff, and then go back there. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, horses get exploited at so many points in their life, and it, it's always really hard to see pictures of a horse that obviously someone put a lot of thought into the care and breeding of those horses, you know, those quarter horse, racing quarter horses. But the one place where I think people most... Um, care about the individual horse is is at the time that they're born and bred. And I think that by focusing um, some of our efforts to promote ID um, at the time the horse is born and bred is really going to have some stickiness. I, I think that's going to be very sticky. Um, I think once these horses get you know older and out it, it, it becomes harder. But I think, I think that's where people really have a stake in making sure that the horse has an ID. Um, and it, it's, an, it's an investment in that horse's welfare. And, and as, you know, for that horse, and then it's that horse's community, and then it's our industry. So um, I really think that, that we're, we're on something about starting with where the horse is born and bred. Cliff? Um, I have a question, Angela. The, you, you mentioned the, some of your case studies that they were microchipped. I'm assuming those animals were microchipped while they were in Mexico? You know, I don't think so. The, um, it's really hard to say. It's hard to say because I couldn't really fully trace kind of a little bit of a pathway on, on how that chip got into that horse. It's hard for me to tell. I think the one with the fish the fish microchip, I think that one was implanted in Mexico. That's that's pretty good guess for me. Hey, this works, right? Okay. Um, for the, definitely the the Spanish microchips, those were done in Spain um, and recorded in Spain. So uh, there's a clear pathway there. Some of these others, uh, you know, we really can't tell. Um, I do worry a little bit with um, if we just go to 840 tags, and that's certainly an option. Um, we really do need that microchip lookup tool, guys, because then, then I lose my ability to even go to a specific manufacturer, right? So think about that in your thought process. Alex says no. Um, if I don't have the Prem ID in my database, or I can't find one of you that has it, um, it it's lost to me just the same. I, I don't even have. What well, should be? It should be, right? And how many times do you and Talani go back and forth, right? Do you have it? No, I've got it over here. Well, maybe I got it over here. It's the, sa it's the same stuff we're doing now, right? 
you would hope that it would be better. You want to believe that that process is more streamlined. It's certainly been built to be. Um, but just you know, think about some of that. I, I really think that lookup tool, industry-wide, people are going to use that. People want to know the history of their horse. I mean, think about this. If you get a racing thoroughbred that for the first four years of its life, you have no idea, was it a good racehorse? Did it suck? Did it never race? Did it chip? You know, what, what happened to this horse? People want to look that stuff up. And if it's their horse and they have their number, they can go get some of the information on that. It, it's sort of all that Ancestry.com searching that we do on ourselves, right? Look how popular it is for people to go DNA themselves and find out their heritage, right? Horse owners care about that too, especially if they know they're one of a long line of homes that that horse has had. Um, we didn't mention, and we probably should, um, the rescue organizations, right? There's an entity that really does care about what has this horse been through, where has it been, what can we do to get it in a good home? Um, and that's another entity that might really want that type of a microchip lookup tool to assist them in what they're doing too. I, I just have a quick question also after that. If the information from these animals, the permanent IDs on these animals are not being recorded appropriately as they cross the border, going to or coming coming into the United States, going from or coming into the United States. Yep. It, the industry, we don't have control over your, or the USDA's. Um, Correct. <laughs> no we got to fix it. We got to fix it, Cliff. How, how is that, who needs to be approached to respond to that? And is it purely a technological drawback? Is it a cultural sh situation or do we need do we need to revisit the entire process altogether? Other species don't have this problem. As well, because they I don't come back. The, see, that's our deal. The other species, right, they really don't come back. It's kind of generally a one-way path, right? But I was, still, I was still part of traceback issues sure. when I would ship animals to developing countries, and I, they were faxing us requests for traceback, and the USDA could pull one animal out of 3,000 in a couple of hours. Yep. And I mean, their entire process on the cattle side, and that's scale. So I don't know if the horses are too small, of, you know, if each project, because they're 20 animals at a time, if it's too small for the USDA to notice. I think it's a history of us not recording that information properly, Cliff, because it hasn't been asked for, okay? But I think that's changing, and I know that our import and export services have worked very hard, specifically with the import process, and specifically with the horses coming through international um, airports and through our import service centers. Um, those horses obviously come in with microchips because they're coming from countries that do microchip. They're coming in with a lot more information, and I know that NIES is doing a much better job of trying to record that information in appropriate databases that are searchable. Um, we have gaps at the Mexican border through the land border ports for sure. That needs work. They are aware of it. They are trying to work on it. They are trying to improve it. Um, and definitely with the export process, I know um, our export side and our service centers on that side, they have the same complaints about this system, that we really don't have a good searchability, especially down for horses to the individual animal level. And we have very limited searchability, even on just each load, um, like this case for the, the Glanders reactor, right? So they're aware of all this. I believe they're working really hard on it. Um, those of us state and federal who you know, really need this information when on the domestic side it's important for us to continue the trace on our end, um, we're going to continue to pressure them and to work with them to do the best we can to improve those systems. And I think eventually we will get there. I don't expect the industry to fix that problem. If it stays broken and it doesn't move, though, maybe we should all comment on that. But I think they're, they're taking really good steps and initiative to improve that process. Adding the microchip on our end in the U.S. side would really help. Again, the only horses that are required to be chipped to leave the country are the stuff going to slaughter in Mexico. That's really backwards, guys. That's really backwards. And for the things that already are microchipped, that's really not being recorded. I, I would really like to see a day when the veterinary practitioner, the accredited veterinarian who's writing the export health certificate and certifying all this information, when it has all of those boxes for the permanent ID, I want it to be automatic that they know the horse has a chip and they put it in there. I don't want it to even be a question. Oh, yep, I know this horse has a chip. That goes in the box. 
and then let us on the import export side make sure that we update our system so that that is a searchable part of what we can do. Um, but it's a, it's a change in culture on both sides. Um, we have asked USAHA, US Animal Health Association, has asked in several different resolutions for years that we want to require microchips for horses imported into the US. You guys have already said most of the horses imported through the US through our import service centers are already chipped. It would be no big deal. The ones that we're missing are the southern border, okay? That, that would be the problem. What we're told and have been told for many years is because we do not have a requirement or some sort of system for vast microchipping of horses in the US, we can't require that in another country. We can't artificially say, we need you to this standard if our whole country is down here at this standard. So these initiatives that you're talking about, as more of the industry takes on microchipping as part of their way of doing business, I don't think they can use that excuse anymore. If we do have microchipping systems to track horses in the United States in the industry, there's no reason why we can't require that of another country. Those would be equivalent. And that argument, out the window. And I haven't heard another argument. Oh, that's the only one. Um, we have time for one more question. For those of you that have additional questions, if you can just write them down and we'll get back to them. Um, at the end of the day today, we have some time. We'll get back to them. So I apologize for cutting it short, but I want to make sure you get your break. So go ahead, Mary. This is an, a question that's a two-hat comment. Okay. So my first hat I like these. I'm going to put on is my USEF hat. I just got in touch with the USEF horse recording department, the managing director, to just make sure that my answer was correct. So for traceability, since they will be at this moment the repository of the microchip lookup tool for our side of the industry, 15 years they can really trace back all the way through that horse's life. Now, I'm taking off my USEF hat because, you know, they, it's their data, right? And they're hanging on to it tight. Correct. So now I'm putting on my USHJ hat, and I spoke to Summer because USHJ does have a, a relationship with Equicor, and I said to her, so knowing that 60% of our horses are imported from Europe, can ultimately can her database help us with the information to give to you for trace backs, and I'm going to let her answer that. So yeah, currently we're merging records from the United States with Europe, so it would be possible for us to help give you a, a country of origin. Your example of the Spanish PRE is a really good one. We got very excited when we saw it up there because we knew exactly what it was from the FEI's database. And the FEI requires microchips for their competitions. Yes. And so um, we understand, and we've actually Chelsea to my left is the one that has mapped out all of the breeds that is currently tracked in the FEI's database and uh, current, uh, actually it's an interesting fact when we asked our developers for a list of all of the breed registries as they were currently entered in the FEI's database and the relating countries, we expected a few hundred, especially with uh, mistakes in spelling. We got over 10,000 lines. Oh my. So. Chelsea went through every line of the 10,000 and, and mapped them back to the correct. Chelsea, uh, will you come work with me and help me with epidemiology? No. <laughs> Sorry. This whole row would revolt against you. Uh, but no, uh, so it is possible, going back to Mary's comment, it would be possible to even um, track them back to Europe potentially. Thank you, guys. Uh, and that's, that's why I really wanted to hear from you guys at this meeting is I know there's stuff that's already in place. I know we have vendors here who have wonderful things that they've built that work well, and they've been sitting waiting for an atmosphere that will want or need to use their applications, and I think we're there. Um, so I'm really excited to have that information. I will be contacting you somewhere to work with you on that, and I really appreciate the time, you guys. And, and certainly your um, opening us to listen to some of the you know, these are minor disasters. I, I can scare the smack out of lots of people with a lot of other disease stuff. Traceability is kind of mellow. So. <laughs>